one quick announcement. Um, we have a lost and found. So you can find it on your way out. And I actually found a Mexico passport on the floor and I took it to the front desk. Is it yours? Okay. So you might want to stop by the front desk for that. Um, and then we had some requests. Uh, if we could have everyone turn off their phones. And it was a little bit destructive to some people because people were texting. I, some people are like taking notes on their computer or their phone, that's fine. But just step outside to text if you don't mind. Now I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, actually Tim's gonna get us started. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry, I was shot. I'm fine, I'm on the um, so, Patali Joyce Guruji always said that Ashtanga Yoga is Patanjali Yoga. And we would say, well, what do you mean by that? And he said that Patanjali is Delhi. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dhamma, Niyama, Samandaya, Stoangami. Patanjali is Delhi. <laughs> So he said, should, should we study the Yoga Sutras? And he said, oh, the Yoga Sutra, some difficult. He says, you, you're not knowing Sanskrit. Some difficult. But yes, let it be. You do. Something like that. So we've all studied the Yoga Sutras to some extent. And uh, today we're going to offer some of the fruit of our, of our study. Sponsored by Starbucks. <laughs> okay, who was it? What would we be talking about? Jama and Yama. Corporate consumption. Right? So, when you begin to study the Yoga Sutras, uh, once you get into chapter two, finally, in the 29th Sutra, the second chapter, you, you come across that particular sutra and you find the Indians of Yoga. Okay, and then immediately afterwards, Patanjali breaks it down. He gives us a little bit of time, starting with Yama. So we're going to begin our discussion with Yama, and each of us has been assigned or has chosen one Yama to speak upon. Um, basically, yama is usually defined as something like abstentions. Um, basically, they are designed to govern our behavior as social beings. So, they're quite simple in concept, and I think they're just based on the law of karma, which says that whenever you do comes back to you in kind, basically. Um, so if memory serves me correctly, I think Nancy has the first yama, ahimsa. Yes. We go. So ahimsa is nonviolent. So for me, nonviolence and that concept first came to me when I was about 10 years old, maybe 89. And I was about, my father had come home, they were going to have a big dinner party at their house. We were, of course, non vegetarian. I was eating a lot of meat and all of that. But I never actually seen a living creature being killed. So my father came home with lobster. I think there were five or six of these lobsters, and my sisters and I named them. We didn't know what was going to happen to them. Uh, and I still remember Henrietta. She's very <laughs> So we were down there, and we were really enjoying these strange creatures that were in our kitchen. And all of a sudden, my mom put these four pots of water. So we were like, what's going to happen? And she told us she was going to put these living creatures 
that I was already pretty attached to in the water, and they were going to eat them. So I became rather disturbed, and I was sent to my room. I begged them, and now in hindsight, this is the most awful thing I did. I begged them to cook Henry at last. <laughs>
self competitive. <coughs> I mean, I, we look at other people doing practice and, and want to emulate it or be like that. But it's, and it's fine to do that, except that we also have to realize our own limitations. And I think for me, because I came from a place where I was very limited, and I still have limitations. It doesn't mean I wasn't doing yoga from the beginning. I was learning, my body was learning. So it isn't so much that every day has to look the same. I think any one of us can tell you that some days are just better than others. Some years are better than others. Your foot may stay, my foot was staying behind my head for 10 years. Then I had my daughter and it wouldn't stay there for three years. And it was just gone. Other things had gotten better. So things come and go. So the initial learning of this series, you're so wanting more, you're so wanting the next stage, stage and it's which is great. That's what's going to keep you going. But then you realize that things come and go. You may do something for a while and then it's gone. If you're beating yourself up about it, yeah, that's not yoga. You just accept that today it stayed there, today it didn't stay there. Maybe I'll do better tomorrow, and then let it go. And don't carry it with you even all day. Because that is also being violent to yourself, to be constantly judging yourself as good or bad. I and mean, there's no good or bad in a, a yoga practice. As far as I'm concerned, you show up to do it, you, you're good. <laughs> you know, there's, um, and I think there's a lot of that that goes on within the context of the yoga. So, also for women, this is the subject I think that I know a lot of the male teachers send the women to me to talk about this. So since I have this book, <laughs> throw it in. When I met Guruji, I had 10 day periods. And I slept and threw up through most of them. He told me I didn't know the rule, yeah, that you couldn't practice during the period. So I told Saraswati thinking maybe the teacher you know, needed to know something about it. And they told me I couldn't practice for 10 days. So the first month, I was very, very angry. I was a women's liver, you know, it was 1973, the beginning of the women's liver movement. So I, in my heart, was thinking, this man is a male show who's pig. <laughs> That's the term for the pig. So I, been, I wasn't allowed to speak to Tata Joyce or Ramesh during that time. And I would sit on the front stoop and I started complaining bitterly, complaining to a mom. And she said, shh, you be quiet. The women started this. Yes. 
stuck on a huge set. Fun such a I keep thinking of what's called the categorical imperative. Um, and you know, after all of these yamas are stated in the Yoga Sutra, then they call all of them the Mahavrata, or the great vow. So you're vowing that under all circumstances, no matter the time or the place or anything, that you're going to follow these yamas. The nonviolent satyam, you know, Seha, stealing, Varana Chari. Which means to act within auto. And then Aparigraha, not to grasp all around all over the place. That you're going to do this unconditionally, categorically, um, which is just astonishing. Um, because as soon as you set out to do them, you, you end up. Catch 22 situations. Um, and, and I was just, um, you know, like a, a terrorist takes over your local school. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, you have to take an extreme example. And they, um, they're holding everyone hostage, including your, your kids. Mm-hmm. And, and you know that they're your cousin, Barney, or something. You know they're great, and you love them. But you know that he's totally <coughs> crazy. And uh, you have the choice, and you're given the opportunity to either take out Barney or let him blow up, you know, and kill 5,000 kids. And there it is. And, but I take the Mahabharata. I can't be any, I can't be violent at all. Arjuna was in this situation. Oh. So, but, um, oh, I don't want to give it away. <laughs> but the, the Gita would say, yes, you, you can take out Barney um, non-violently, even if you have to terminate his, uh, his vehicle. <laughs> you, can, you can keep him in your heart. <laughs> Just like a good cop, you know. Oh, I'm sorry, Barney. We love you. Parents love you, but sorry. (laughs) We're often, as adults, placed in these situations. Um, Or it's just like um, the the battle that's going on in your intestines between good bacteria and the bad bacteria. You know about that one? (laughs) And you might not want to take sides. (laughs) <laughs> but it's kind of the, there's a the Vedic saying jiva jiva si jivanam that life lives off of life and uh, that's just the way it is it's kind of tough so anyway let me go on to something um, one of the, the things that has kept me away from Not far away, but right on the, you know, really close to the, on the, <coughs> of um, religious, professing, you know, a religious belief in a particular uh, style. You know, I'm just doing the Ashtanga thing as an experiment, okay? <laughs> this whole thing is an experiment. Um, but rather than less like, you know, saying I know for absolute certain, you know, that this is absolute truth, then, when I, I used to live in the Middle East, and I had, you know, the opportunity to do Hajj to Mecca. And my friends were going to take it, and I knew how to fake it. You just have to know certain verses in the Quran, and uh, that way, when they they got you, you know, and you can, well, you know, actually most of them, <laughs> them. and uh, let you go. But one of the, I didn't want to do the Hajj because I wasn't really a Muslim. Uh, and I had a, a great appreciation for the mystical aspects of the song. But in my heart of hearts, or my, the mind of my mind, I'm 
knew that I did not know for certain that Muhammad was the last and final prophet. <coughs> and similarly, I didn't know that the prophet before Muhammad, um, who was Jesus, um, was the be all end all. You know, that, that, that this actually happened historically. And likewise, you know, I had some feeling for the, the whole point of it. You know, I thought it was a good find. And then back the prophet before they, who were the other prophets? Like Isaiah, Moses, you know, you know, I didn't know for sure if Moses had actually parted the sea, or if that was a metaphor. Because I wasn't there, at least I don't remember. <laughs> It's coming back. <laughs> but even if I remember when I was there with Moses parting, see, I don't know if that's a fabric, an implanted memory, or if it actually happened you know, in a shared uh, time and space on the planet Earth. And so the, this thing of Satyam uh, says, I, to be really honest with you, um, I don't know if Muhammad was the final prophet. Therefore, I can't say that I'm truly uh, a good Muslim. I think I'm a good Muslim. You know? I don't know if Muhammad knew if Muhammad was the final prophet. Think about that. <laughs> or when we get later to Ishwara, uh, how would you know if you're omniscient? <laughs>
<laughs> and if I am able to actually practice, then that kind of undercurrent, that sensation in my prana of doubt, that sensation of like, that arises, uh, that places me in a state of really not knowing even what my intentions are. I just watch intentions when they go. I can't actually just be there with that as the vritti in meditation. So I'm, in a sense, not honest. So honesty is a huge part of contemplation and practice. Because even though I sit, you know, I say I, I, the actual intentions are the vasanas and the different sankalpas, the true sankalpas that come up, which are like, you know, just the, the ordinary desires that come and go, moment by moment. And you have to be able to see them without, you know, that's not me here. So it's amazing if you just sit and allow, you know, create a space so that your mind can manifest as it is. It might not be as angelic. <laughs> The yamas would, you know, it, it could be quite demonic. In fact, just because the demonic thought comes and goes, I hope all sentient beings burn. <laughs> like a T Rex or something. <laughs> and actually, your mind is perfectly capable of constructing the most fantastic demonic mean thoughts. My mind is. <laughs> you would be shocked. Okay. And for me to actually do yoga, I have to allow those patterns to arise. And then I have to observe those patterns without accepting them or rejecting them mindfully. And then I actually see through them that there's, you know, it's merely a thought form. So the thought form becomes steady, the vritti. You have to, so in meditation, it's really hard to meditate on what is not arising. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> I'm going to meditate on the unmanifest. Okay. Krishna recommends, he doesn't recommend, in the Gita, Arjuna says, what, which is easier, O oh Krishna, to meditate on um, the unmanifest, <laughs> or to meditate on you as you presented yourself, Gita, which is, is everything around you. So it's very difficult. If you have a body, it's very difficult to meditate on the unmanifest, that which is not arising. And so the basic pattern of yoga is you, when something arises as pretty, that's what you meditate on. And it might not be the one you planned. Okay. You know, I have all intention of just, I sit and I'm going to see angels with four arms and they nice smiles. And two seconds later into your meditation, you're off and running. And so honesty is, is allows you to actually feel, to allow the mind to fully manifest itself as it is. And in that way, um, you can start to see through the whole charade. So it's an extremely important. Oh, yeah. Actually, to be honest. No.
you're able to see the beauty rather than just going off in the story or the fiction or the kind of role in the game that the mind plays, which is false. And so Satcham means epistemology. You can Google that.
this is a different type of uh, things coming your way. It's because there is this absent of, of, of desire for them. Uh, Hari Harinanda further comments that the gems or jewels are not always um, inanimate objects like rubies and diamonds and gold coins and silver cups of coffee from Starbucks, etc. <laughs> Sometimes they are people as well, wise people, highly conscious beings, um, perhaps um, guardian spirits, etc., etc. So all these things will be attracted to, to these type of people. Um, so uh, this is a pretty basic thing. I have a feeling most of the people here, you know, we don't steal stuff very often. Um, <laughs> Stealing physical objects is not something that most people have gotten this far, um, yeah, nor still doing. <laughs> My wife, on the other hand, you know, she's happy to pinch a peanut um, from the peanut cart when we're walking down the street. She's gotten into big trouble in my store for stealing peanuts, by the way. <laughs> um, so, um, what we have, the problems we have actually are. Um, in our society is really an effect of ideas and of concepts um, and of uh, uh, words of other people that we take on as our own. Okay. So I want to talk about that for my remaining seven minutes, but before that, um, I, I would like to say one thing uh, that, um, uh, that Vyasa, who's one of the early commentators on the Yoga Sutras, and Hari Harinanda, and then later also Guruji, said was that, um, that Yama and Niyama are perfected in Samadhi. So by attaining samadhi and gaining knowledge, there is a transformation of our field of consciousness whereby all of these things which would lead us to cause violence or to be dishonest or to steal or as to practice brahmacharya, which I'm not allowed to tell you what it means because David's going to in a minute. <laughs> and I'll put it in the church. <laughs> all these um, all these things are taken care of in in samadhi. Right? Um, so it, either in samadhi or meditation appro uh, approximating samadhi. It doesn't actually actually totally be samadhi, but it can be meditation approximating samadhi. The so Guruji uh, would agree with this too, and he used to say that um, the original. Uh, Yoga was called Shadanga Yoga, which is a six-limbed six yoga. And that asana, uh, yama and yama, occurred in pratyahara, within the fifth limb. That after you perfected to some degree, um, or to your satisfaction, I guess, asana and pranayama, then you were prepared for pratyahara. And pratyahara, according to his definition, was, um, he followed the text called the Yoga Yagni Valkya. Um, I think I'm going to tell you a little secret, actually. As long as you keep saying a lot of Sanskrit words, you don't actually have to be right about anything. This is a trick of the speaker. So, um, Yogi Nandamal is a text written by Yogi Nandamal, and there are the, the, the teachings when um, she was speaking to Parvati and giving her these esoteric instructions in yoga. And the definition of Pratyahara he gives is um, not withdrawal of the senses, but that when you see everything around you, not as an object, but as God, um, that is pratyahara. When you, because generally what we do through our sense organs is we look at things and we think, okay, this is a, you know, a picture, and this is water, and this is a microphone, and this is Tim Miller, and, you know, this is all of you, and this is me, and I see you all as objects. I see me as a subject. <laughs> I have money. And you, know, you all see you as a subject, and you see all of us as the object. This is, so what we want to do, how we can get out of that, um, you know, uh, state of duality is we're going to stop using our sense organs in a subject-object oriented way. So we want to not just turn the senses in on themselves, that doesn't always make a whole lot of sense unless you're in a particular state of mind, but what we want to do is we want to basically correct our vision, how we see things. So if we see everything as, um, you know, whether you call it nature or cosmic forces or the divine or God or Prakriti, whatever term you're comfortable with. When we see everything as a manifestation of that and not as an object, um, 
that is pratyahara. That can lead, lead to dharana, dhyana, and samadhi. So it's actually the first step in that triad. So, um, that is also a meditation approximating samadhi. So when Hariharananda says, oh, you know, yama and yama, you can only perfect them in samadhi, or a meditation approximating it, Guruji okay, agrees by this by saying, yes, in pratyahara, this is where we start to get an understanding of the subject of object of our relationship. That really we're all part of the same divine manifestation. Um, therefore, with that kind of an understanding, nothing belongs to me and nothing belongs to you. Therefore, I will begin to understand that we're all part of the same manifestation. We're all made up of the same stuff. Therefore, there's nothing I need to add to myself which is going to make me feel more whole and complete than I already am. When we feel the need to steal something, I want this picture, you know. It's not because I really need this picture, or it's not anything that has to do with this object. It's that I feel an absence within myself, that I need something to complete me. And that when I have that object, okay, then I'm going to have it all together. So then I want to steal it. So uh, that's why with the letter A coming before Steya, but A states an absence of the need to take something which doesn't belong to me. Why? Nothing belongs to me. Nothing belongs to you. Everything belongs to this whole cycle of nature, to the whole cycle of time, the space of the universe. It just belongs. Not to you, not to me. So in that kind of a mind frame, then automatically there is, there is no stealing. Meantime, don't steal stuff. <laughs> so, now, this can also be applied to ideas because of a lot of us, I'm, how many minutes do I have? Two minutes. Oh, it's, like, <laughs> it's always two minutes. Steal. <laughs> yeah. Steal. 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 I don't have much, you know, I have a question. I don't really have a whole lot to say about cleanliness, so I can theoretically. <laughs> Sorry. I'm using my most, so I have a minute and a half now. So. <laughs> There's a recognition um, in the, uh, in the Vedic or Hindu tradition that, um, that as long, you know, in the same way that nothing belongs to us, um, that knowledge or ideas and practices and philosophies also um, don't belong to us as well. Um, and that everything that we're learning and everything that we're experiencing, uh, whether inside of ourselves or that we read or learn from a book or from a teacher, is built up upon the knowledge which has come uh, before us. So, for example, everyone's um, heard of Luca. It's not a joke. Everyone's heard of Luca, the last universal common ancestor. And every time I say, have you heard about Satan or whatever, you know it's a joke, but now you're like, Luca, who's that? <laughs> so Luca, the last universal common ancestor, is um, the, um, the furthest gene that they could trace back in the <coughs> to going back about three and a half billion years. And later on we'll talk about how long a billion is, but an interesting conversation. The difference, you know the difference between a million, a billion, and a trillion? Okay, I'll save that for later. So the... Um, a trick I learned from Richard, it's leading on. So, so um, <laughs> so what happens is cell, it divides, and then it divides, and it divides, and it divides, and it divides, and some of the cells that it divides and do uh, develop, you know, uh, sexually reproductive characteristics, and then they begin to reproduce, and some of the cells, you know, uh, they're defective, they don't quite work when they divide, there's, you know, there's problems with them. Everything in our entire universe, which we can see now in front of us, and on this planet, let's say, is from uh, the original division of the cell. Um, so, therefore, it's all coming from one place, and, and this is called um, evolution, right? Now, we have another thing, and what is the evolution? And it is the, um, uh, it's copying, it is um, multiplying, and it is assimilating. So knowledge is the same type of a thing. That's a, this is a biological evolution, but we have a social evolution as well, which is based on ideas. 
And ideas are the same types of things. They, you know, they divide. And then we reproduce them, we copy them. That's how we learn things. We learn things by copying. Um, uh, I was talking about this with, uh, with MC Yogi and Amanda uh, the night before last. Um, that, um, who was it? Uh, what's the name of that guy again? That crazy guy who was out in um, Nevada or Texas or something, and he took a lot of drugs and he was writing a lot. Hunter Thompson, thank you. Hunter Thompson, one, in order to learn how to be a great writer, he completely hand typed the great Gatsby, like word for word, page by page, until he got to the end of it, because he wanted to see what it felt like. I know my two minutes are up to write a great book. So this is what we do. Seriously, he did that. And, um, and he wasn't high when he might have been. And, um, that's probably why he did it. So we, we copy until we understand how to do a form. Until we understand, okay, this makes up something great. Then we assimilate it. And then from there we have a base of knowledge where it can grow. We can do something with it. So when Guruji says something like, this one that Guru taught me, I didn't change anything. You know, what he's saying in a certain regard is that everything I've learned, which allowed me to understand and get to the place where I got up, I learned from my guru, and I learned from the Sanskrit college, and the text I studied filled me with knowledge to the point where that was, it. you know, I stood on the shoulders of, I think it was Isaac Newton who said, we stand on the shoulders of all the giants who came before us. And um, therefore, for him to take ownership of what he had done with the yoga would have gone against his tradition. Him say, yeah, I invented this. This is like my thing. It's awesome. Check it out. You can't do that. That's what we're all doing in the West by inventing new things and taking ownership of it and claiming that we can create new systems and we can have these things that we can market in. You know, in, I'm, I'm not targeting any particular thing. Someone asked me, oh, when you said that yesterday, were you talking about like Anasara yoga? I'm not, okay? No, I'm not talking about Anasara or Shivananda or Osho or anything. This is general. This is in all of us. This is something we have to look at, in fact, as we move forward. Like this is a super cool opportunity we have now that we're all like here together moving forward in the world of yoga. We should understand that we are standing on a great, great tradition. And to not acknowledge and have respect for that tradition and understand where these ideas came from, it is a type of stealing. Harion. Discipline. 
But actually, yoga means we have to become very aware. If we're here with each person, to start seeing a common thread. It's a heightened state of awareness. And it doesn't mean we don't have senses. Certainly, we have senses. We're sensual beings. Bhagavad Gita describes the five senses to be like five raging horses. And they're pulling a chariot. And in the chariot is sitting a chariot driver. The chariot is like a cart. And there are reins on these horses. So the five senses are like these five horses. Our body is like this chariot being pulled along. But what if that's all there was? There's no reins and there's no driver, and the horses are just running. Yeah. Or there's a driver, but there's no reins. All you can do is yell at the horses. Yeah. <laughs> They'll probably pull you off a cliff. So the reins are the mind, and the person sat there in the heart is the self. So we take the self to control the senses, to direct them where we want to go. But it doesn't mean no senses. No sensual being means we need to control them. Then we can enjoy the, the sensual nature, but it's going to, we can direct where, what, in what direction we want to be led, right? Um, so, as one becomes a teacher of anything, yoga, a professor, um, anyone standing up in front of a bunch of people, can start getting a sense of power, right? Or yoga practice, <coughs> of yoga cities, yeah, cities that are developed. Who knows what some of the cities are? Not cities like Mumbai, but <laughs> cities. Yeah. You can become larger than the largest, smaller than the smallest. You can reach out and touch the moon with your finger. You can ride up the sunbeam to the sun planet. You can manifest objects, levitate, all kind of stuff. Sounds cool, right? But really, what's the benefit? What even is the benefit of levitation other than I could, you know, maybe get a free beer if I went to a bar and check it out? <laughs> <laughs> but unless I could pick up Shelly, my wife, and all of our luggage and levitate from here all the way back home to our cat in Austin, Texas, it really doesn't help much, right? So cities, as you read about them, you find out that they're distractions. They're almost like little tests thrown out there for us. Along the, along the way, along the practice of yoga. So one thing that happens when we start practicing asanas, you start going like, oh, wow, I'm good at this. And somebody comes up to you and they go, wow, you're good at that. And we say, yeah, I'm really good at it. Give you this sense of, uh, and what's interesting in the early days, you know, we would do this, and at some point, pretty quickly, the Tommy Joyce would introduce pranayama. So all these asanas you're going like this, they sit down and try to do a little pranayama, and you're like, wow, I can't really do much of anything. <laughs> can't hold my breath five seconds, I'm freaking out. <laughs> and at some point, pranayama kind of drifted away a little bit, and I think just because of the numbers of people, which is maybe another conversation, but we have to be careful as you're pumping all of this energy into the body and increasing prana and life force. At some point, you can get a little glow. You know, you see somebody that's healthy or how do you, wow. And so there is a point where it becomes dangerous. And I would think the most dangerous city of all is the one in which other people become attracted to you. Because at that point, we have to think of ourselves like a bank teller. A, a person at the bank all day long, people are handing them money. And they take that money and say, thank you very much, and they put it in your bank account for you. That's what they do, that's their job. But what happens the day they hand you that money and they say thank you very much and they put it in their pocket, right? And they start just keeping it for their own. Now it becomes a problem. So if someone starts developing the benefits of the practice and someone goes, wow, it is really our duty to take that 
and deposit it in the account of the people that taught us this stuff. They're, they're recognizing the symptoms of some energy we've received as a gift from someone else, like the word guru, <coughs> darkness to light. The concept is that we're in a cave and it's very dark. And we have a candle and no matches and no way of lighting it. And over there, we see someone in the house with a candle. Like a lot of school, we walk over that person extends their candle with a flame on it, and we touch ours to it, and now we get light. So someone has information and knowledge they hand us. They extend that knowledge. We now have knowledge. Right? So there's a thread of brahmacharya here. So when we gain this knowledge and information, we have a responsibility. And it is very easy to abuse power. And it is honestly rare when people don't. It's not so much amazing when someone does. It's honestly more amazing when someone doesn't. I don't remember who told me this, so I can't give them direct credit. But um, anybody up here can take credit if they want to, if you like it. <laughs> If you want to really find out something about someone, or, or if any of us really want to know our true character, let that person have everything they think they want and see what happens next. Yeah, that's when problems arise, is when all of a sudden we have everything we think we want. So brahmacharya, I believe also we could say means ethics. Ethics means treating people with respect, treating people with equal respect. Everyone in a yoga class deserves equal respect. If a person in a position of power, a teacher, is being observed. Every little thing is being observed. So as we find out, there's responsibility. We have to be honest, be who we are. But at the same time, interactions become um, there's responsibility with that and how we deal with others. So, Brahmacharya is not easy. But Tabi Joyce, it's amazing. I mean, the, the more I think about this man, the more really amazed I am by him. He spoke very little English. He didn't demonstrate asanas. And yet, he taught every series of Ashtanga Yoga without ever showing the asana and taught depth of philosophy with, like, 27 words of English, a few of which were bad and man and lady and boom. <laughs> so he conveyed, it was incredible how he could do that, right? By his, his presence. And he used to say, Whoa, yoga is not easy. And it sounds at first like, well, duh. <laughs> so what's he talking about, yoga is not easy? What part of yoga is not easy? Is it not easy to get our leg behind our head or to jump through or jump back? Yeah, maybe those things are not easy. But is that what he's talking about? <laughs> or is it what happens the rest of the day? All of our interactions. I like to think of it like this. There's a difference between doing yoga or just making an asana of ourselves. <laughs> we can make all kinds of shapes. But if we're a mean, nasty person the rest of the day, what? Tim wants to take credit for that. Cloud is not timekeeper man too. He is not even watching the game.
Okay, I'm going to go down a side thing just because I start opening a can of jokes. But um, <laughs> if it does make it to the Olympics, eventually there's going to be a speed event. <laughs> okay, where are the judges? Commentators. They're exciting, Nancy. So the third time here, we've had the opening Olympics. <laughs> Chuck and Deb competing this year for first place. <laughs> Chuck is the defending champion, full primary series, seven minutes. And <laughs> 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 She's been training very hard. She's sponsored by Red Bull this year. <laughs> to be 
established in. So once one is established in a paribraha, or non-grasping, graha means to grasp. Um, in fact, in Vedic astrology, graha is the word given to, we talked about this yesterday a little bit, do you remember? The grahas are the planets, right? So as the planets pass through the various constellations, they're thought to grasp the energy of those particular constellations and sort of pull them into the, the Earth's sphere, where they then sort of grab a hold of us. So we get grabbed by the planets as well. <coughs> certain transits. So graha, grasping. So when we're firmly established in non-grasping, according to Patanjali, something happens. Janma, janma ketamta sambodha. So janma refers to one's birth. Um, Katamta means something like purpose, the hows and wives and wherefores, and Samodaha means something like a deep understanding. So if we put it all together into one coherent phrase, what do we say? When we become persevering in our non-grasping attitude in life, we gain a deep understanding of something, the purpose of our birth. It sounds important, <laughs> somehow, doesn't it? Um, this sort of relates back to a sutra in the first chapter, actually one of my favorite sutras in chapter one. Sutra number 12, you know that one? <coughs> Maybe we can do it together again. Yes, and before 13. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so I think maybe you could repeat this one after me. Okay? Again, this is uh, chapter 1, Sutra 12. I'm trying to remember what it is again. Okay, here we go. Abhyasa. Abhyasa. Vairagya Vyam. Vairagya Vyam. That's it. Very short. <laughs>